Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. With the Cabinet appointed and the State of the Nation due next week, the troubles at ESCOM and SAA are set to re-emerge as key problems for government to tackle. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the outlook for both firms. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. One problem shared by SAA and ESCOM is that of leadership. Yes, uh, we heard earlier this year it was a shock resignation by Pakamani Khadebe from Eskom on health grounds. We know it's been a very torrid period for the leader of Eskom, or for the 10 leaders now of Eskom since the crisis of 2008. But it, uh, I think that during this last period of Mr. Khadebe's uh, tenure, it had been particularly torrid uh, given the pushback uh, from Labour and from forces that were outside Eskom that are linked to state capture that really made it a quite a difficult period. And I think there's been no doubt that he took a lot of strain. So there's that leadership void that has to be filled. And uh, that, that really, uh, we, that hasn't been clear how that's going to be fulfilled yet. We know that uh, Mr. Khadebe stays until the end of July. And uh, really the challenge facing Eskom is as much financial re-engineering or engineering as it is technical. So I think that the uh, uh, government or the shareholder and the board will have to be looking at who can navigate this uh, difficult financial period, um, be able to calm the markets and also convince the shareholder uh, to uh, continue to support uh, the company. So it's going to be interesting to see who replaces uh, uh, Pakamani Khadebe. At SSA, similarly, there was a, sim a, a very shock resignation of Vianik Jahana. Uh, he was seemed to be quite popular and seemed to be making some progress. And uh, on top of it, his resignation letter w was leaked into the media and made it clear that he didn't feel he was getting the support he needed from the shareholder and it was becoming untenable for him. So not a, uh, not a good day at the office for uh, either the shareholder or for the SAA. There we know that the decision was to allow him to leave almost immediately and um, uh, Zooks Ramasia has been appointed as acting CEO while they do a internal, external, domestic and global search for a new CEO. SAA also has some immediate liquidity problems to solve. Yes, that's become very clear and I think that was the frustration for Vianney Jahana. I think that uh, they needed to have some visibility and some certainty of a liquidity runway uh, that was getting shorter and shorter during his tenure. Uh, they they did, uh, that did get some support in terms of guarantees and an injection from the shareholder last year, which was very unpopular, which enabled, enabled them to raise some short-term bridging finance of 3.5 million uh, rand. That, uh, that uh, term of that bridging loan now comes to end June, July, so they need to find a way to replenish that and to, to, to create a new liquidity runway. On top of it, they've got some uh, longer-term finance, but over 9 billion that is it's due to come and mature. So it's, it's sort of a, a sort of immediate burning platform for the shareholder and for SAA as to how they get themselves uh, through this period. Uh, the long-term turnaround strategy is suggestive of profitability in 2021-22, uh, or the 2020-21. Um, so to get them to that period, they need to have liquidity. And you can imagine society is very anti-additional bailout for uh, SAA. But for banks, the existing pool of lenders that gave them the bridging finance, mostly domestic banks, and what they say is another pool of lenders that are both domestic and foreign, unless the shareholder makes some sort of move uh, uh, to sort of either retire that 3.5 billion and pay it off on behalf of SAA, uh, it's going to be very hard to get that four billion in liquidity that they need to get to the year where they're going to be profitable, uh, which I think there's a lack of trust around as well, and also to refinance that immediate nine billion plus that's coming due. So uh, basically, as soon as this cabinet lechotla is over, as soon as the states of the nation, if not sooner, there has to be some decisions around whether uh, SIA is going to receive another bailout. So we can expect some push back from society as that happens and, uh, and also there's internal unhappiness at the moment around just uh, the way Vuyani Jokhana left and with some unions protesting 
to have him uh, returned. And I think there's some unhappiness about who is on the board at SIA. But really, the, the issue is finance and liquidity. The crunch is, is, is immediate for the uh, Silver Ramaphosa administration. And a decision is going to have to be taken before the end of July. Then there are the bailout options to consider at ESCOM. Yes, and these are, there's probably a little bit more uh, wriggle room here in terms of timing, but not much more. So we, I think why, why there's some wriggle room is that there's, uh, we know that the, the tariffs increase from April 1, which gives a little bit of relief, although um, ESCOM is going to contest those tariffs, it seems, because they don't feel they got anything where, near where they should have in terms of the methodology. But uh, there's also been the 23 billion rand injection promised uh, over three years at least, and probably for 10 years. That is, uh, if you speak to anyone that looks at uh, Eskom's liquidity and where it's going to, that is far from sufficient. So it's not going to be enough. Um, so, but for the year, I think there is some, there's some space, there's some breathing room using that already, some of that uh, 23 billion has already had to be injected uh, in a, on a sort of emergency basis after the Chinese Development Bank had some misgivings around in, uh, a loan that had, uh, it had already approved and the pace uh, at those that, that was being released into ESCOM. Even that is not clear whether those are being solved. So there are still liquidity challenge, challenges. That's really distracting for the CEO, as we saw with SAA, you know, if you continue looking at just month by month paying the salaries, paying the bills, it's very hard to, to think strategically and more long term. And that's exactly what we're going to have to be doing at ESCOM. We have to think strategically, obviously deal with the liquidity crisis and then think strategically how we're going to get out of this. A number of, a number of bailout options are obviously being looked at here. Um, the, the simplest, I think, is what people uh, push back against earlier is the uh, conversion of the guarantees um, into real, um, rather than contingent liabilities, but real liabilities for the National Treasury, which will be maybe paid as they come due. But that's going to be very unpopular, but the, <laughs> the alternatives are going to be even more unpopular, probably. I think it's going to have to be a combination of more tariff increases, and I think we are going to see court cases around uh, nurses' recent approvals we already know of two, and I think this latest one's also going to be contested uh, in terms of the latest tariff increase. And uh, then there's going to be the shareholder is going to have to be leaned on again in some form of debt relief. What form that takes, as I say, there's the simple one around the guarantees, and I think uh, S&P's global suggests a sort of pay as you go using that that framework. But um, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the the best option. So we know that the ESCOM sustainability task team applying its mind to it have come up with various models, including one that includes uh, a big uh, dipping into the, the international pool of climate finance. So making some moves to reduce our carbon emissions on a more accelerated basis than what we've committed uh, to under Paris, and maybe using that as leverage. But that means we need to get things moving in terms of the integrated resource plan and buying the renewable energy capacity that's going to need to replace the coal capacity that comes off more quickly. So, and we haven't had any decisions around that. No integrated resource plan, no decision around the, the bailout beyond the 23 billion rand a year, and no decision around who's going to lead ESCOM. So these are burning platforms. Both SAA, as I said to you, it's immediate. Once that cabinet meets, it may, it's going to need to be making a decision around that, or there's going to be casualties in terms of being able to pay staff and pay supplies. And then in terms of ESCA, maybe slightly more cushioning in terms of timing. But by, during the course of the next few months, decisions have to be made about how ESCA, about ESCOM's future sustainability. It's future, we already know the restructuring and how that's going to, we don't know, but we don't know how that's going to be managed and unfolded and over how much, over what period. Also, the restructuring doesn't really help with the financial problems at Eskom. It's, uh, it's really, there's, there's going to have to be a massive financial re-engineering. Re it's going to be, I would say, the biggest corporate restructuring South Africa's ever seen. And it's probably going to be the South Africa's uh, government's biggest bailout we've ever seen. And it's not going to be popular. Thank you.
That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.